oh, power lines down here in the road. Wow, I just went over. Oh, that's nice. I just, oh, yeah, there's power lines all over the place here. I, I believe I'm in the damage path where that tornado was at. Okay. Shane, what's your location? Yep. Uh, let's see here. I'm south of Putnam, north of Cust Oh, Highway 47 that goes back towards Thomas. Right. I just passed it, so I'm a couple miles. I'm about a mile south of that intersection. Okay. Well, they're going to have and some damage what, Michael, this out is, there, no doubt. This is, this is kind of crazy because I'm getting some serious wind right here, and um, I see it. it. Your shot is just it's it, it, a picture's worth a thousand words, Shane. We're looking at your video, and and that's. That's scary to have to drive in. That's why we're urging people this, to not be out driving in this. Michael, this isn't, this, I don't, Michael, I'm leaving. I'm going north here. I, this is not good. This is not, this is a normal wind. Okay. Yeah. Be, well, I don't you're, think you're right there wind, Michael. circulation. Here at Birch Bay, Washington, this entire bay you're going to see here in the video that's over two miles wide is completely empty of water on the afternoon of June 16th around 2 p.m. I received a video from Mimi who apparently lives in this area and this is not normal. You're about to see this bay completely drained of water. Here it is. No water. She's probably 200 yards out into the bay. So I would say that that's a little more than just an average low tide event. I mean, maybe that's considered an extreme low tide event. 
I don't think she'd be out here recording if this was normal, let's just put it that way. Let me stop it right here for a second. She points the camera up to the sky, showing us that the weather was decent. There was no storms, no high winds, no cyclones. Cyclones don't get up this high anyway. But the weather was decent, nice, calm, pretty day. So for the water to just disappear like that was very puzzling. In fact, that's what she put in the post that she sent me, you know, like, what's going on? Why is the water retreating like it is? Granted, we're entering the full moon phase here in just a few hours, but this is a little bit extreme. This reminds me of 2017 when we followed these water anomalies all around the world. And here you're looking at a bay that's completely empty, or 90% empty, that's over two miles wide. We saw this a lot back in 2017. We've seen an example once of it this year over in Great Britain, where a bay like this emptied out, exposing a 4,500-year-old forest that had never been seen before. There will be a battle every day of your sojourn on the earth as a Christian. We need to talk about that. Because you and I are living in a fallen, yet to be redeemed body, every day will be a battle between the flesh and the Holy Spirit. If you don't realize that there's an enemy who's going to engage you in battle on a daily basis, You've lost the battle before it ever begins. And the only thing that's almost as worse is not even recognizing you have an enemy, the adversary, the devil, who's going to battle you every day. Almost as bad is underestimating your enemy and just assuming that uh, you're smarter than he is and uh, you're able to figure out what he's about and you're able on your own strength and, and wisdom to defeat the devil. You'll never do it in your own strength. He's a lot smarter than you are. He's been around a lot longer. He's got his schemes and his wiles, and he will just defeat you left and right if you try to battle him in your own strength and in your own wisdom. But there's an enemy there, and he will take the battle to you every day of your life on the earth. And that battle will be between your flesh and the Holy Spirit who dwells within you. Now. However you understand the battle, none of you are going to disagree with me that there's a battle that goes on within you on a daily basis. There is something within you that seems to pull you towards sin. And there's something within you that is pulling you toward righteousness. Now, I'm going to try to clarify this in a moment, okay? But the temptation that Satan serves up is to meet my needs my way, not God's way. To meet my needs totally independent from God, that's the flesh. That's what I'm suggesting is the flesh. And the battle within me is between the Holy Spirit wanting to encourage me to meet my needs through Christ and the devil luring me in this fallen earth suit to try to meet my needs my in BC patterns before Christ apart from Jesus. Look at with me please to Galatians 5:17. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. I looked up every instance in the New Testament where that word lusts shows up and how it's used. And the best I can come to trying to help you understand the spirit lusting against the flesh and the flesh lusting against the spirit. It means to struggle for dominance. This word means a fervent passion, a fervent passion that demands satisfaction, that wants to control the person who embraces it. So apparently the flesh struggles to, to control and repel the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit struggles to dominate the flesh. 
and you're in the middle. You've got to decide what's going to happen in your life, whether you're going to follow the flesh or you're going to follow the spirit. You have to make the decision, all right? But there is a battle that's raging. The flesh and the spirit are irreconcilable. Irreconcilable. Read with me Romans 8, 6, please. For the fleshly mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God. Now let me try to help you to understand here. The law of God would be the Word of God. The law of God would be the Lordship of Jesus. The law of God would be being led by the Spirit of God. Those who are the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. That, that, all of that is in that concept of the law of God. All right? Now, let's try to help you understand the flesh and the spirit and why they are irreconcilable in your life and in my life. First of all, the flesh asserts my independence from God. The flesh, I did it my way. I did it my way. I'm doing it my way. Hang God. I'm gonna do it my way. I'm asserting my independence. I kick Jesus off the throne. I put myself on the throne. That's the flesh. I assert my independence. The spirit is I assert my dependency by submitting to Jesus. I let him sit on the throne of my heart. Romans uh, John 15, Jesus is the true vine, I'm a branch, I abide in Christ. That's my dependency. I acknowledge I need Jesus. I want him to live his life through me. The flesh is self-centered. Self-centered. Flesh can't be anything but self-centered. The spirit is Christ-centered. Well, when Jesus is sitting on the throne of my heart, my whole life revolves around Jesus. If I'm facing a problem and I'm going to let Jesus sit on the throne of my heart, I'm going to face the problem in a Jesus-centered fashion. But if I'm sitting on the throne of my heart and I'm facing a problem, I have no resources but myself. So my solution is going to be very self-serving. The flesh is self-empowered. Again, if I'm sitting on the throne of my heart and living in sin, I'm grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. He cannot fill and empower me, so I have no source of power but myself. But in the Spirit, I'm spirit power, Spirit empowered. If Jesus is on the throne of my heart and I'm Christ-centered, I'm approaching a problem from a Jesus perspective, then surely the Holy Spirit wants to empower me and give me the grace and the strength to do what Jesus wants me to do, right? Sure. So I'm spirit empowered. In the flesh, I trust myself. In the Spirit, I trust the Lord Jesus. If you're ever trusting yourself, you know you're in the flesh. In the flesh, I meet my own needs, my way. In the Spirit, I trust Jesus to meet my needs. The flesh does produce pleasure and some satisfaction, or we would not employ the flesh to meet our needs. I mean, if, if a, you've got a need and you try the flesh and it doesn't satisfy that need, at least temporarily, why would you ever go back to the flesh to try to meet a need like that again? It has to satisfy. Does the Bible say there's pleasure in sin for a season? Yes, it does. So what happens is, is we decide we're going to meet a certain need in the flesh and it brings some pleasure and some satisfaction, but it will always bring regret. Always. Why? Because God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that also shall he reap. If we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap to the flesh. If we sow to the Spirit, we're going to reap life eternal, now and forever. So what you sow to, you're going to reap. And if there's a God in heaven who is righteous and holy, he is not going to let you be satisfied and fulfilled meeting your own needs in a way that is contrary to his law, contrary to his will, contrary to his love, contrary to his glory. He is not going to let you fulfill your needs to the complete 100% maximum possible 
because I would encourage you to continue meeting your needs that way. But when you and I choose in the Spirit to let Christ meet our needs, there will be joy, there will be fulfillment, there will be satisfaction with blessing. With blessing. If I want to meet my need my way, there may be temporary pleasure and satisfaction, but not only will it bring regret into my life, it will bring regret into the lives of everybody who loves and cares for me. If I want to meet needs in the Spirit, not only do I get blessed, but everybody who is dear and precious to me, they get blessed as well. Now, they may not all like it, because they may not be walking, all of them, in the Spirit. All right? I have no control over whether other people walk in the Spirit or not. But those who love me who are walking in the Spirit will rejoice. All right, let me make three suggestions that are important in this battle of the Spirit. Number one, choose to reject the flesh. Choose to seek to meet your needs in your power, in your wisdom, apart from Christ. In Romans 8.13, would you read that with me, please? For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. Notice Paul is saying, how do you put to death the deeds of the body? How do you reject the flesh? You have to do it by the Holy Spirit. But you have to choose. That's what Romans 6 is all about. The power of sin has been broken. The old sinful nature has been crucified. You now have a choice. God will make the choice for you. You and I have to choose. We, that's why I say, if you're going to walk in the Spirit, before your feet hit the ground, the floor, in the morning, and you say, Jesus, I'm yours. I want you on the throne. Yeah. Choose to reject the flesh. When, as soon as you realize that you are employing a fleshly means of meeting any need whatsoever, confess it, acknowledge it, reject it, and back up into the Spirit. Because again, you'll get, you'll already be one or two steps into the flesh before sometimes you even realize what you're doing. At least that's my experience. Uh, you can be so focused on the problem or the opportunity that you don't realize exactly what's going on. But the Holy Spirit will let you know. Number two, trust the Spirit for grace. Trust the Spirit for grace. This is not John 15, 10, it's Galatians 5, 23. The fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Self-control. Romans 6. Do not present the members of your body as instruments of sin for unrighteousness, but present the members of your body to God as instruments of righteousness. The choice is yours. The devil can't make you do anything. You and I choose. And then third, Dedicate yourself to God. Dedicate yourself to God. For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hath the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name.